This lecture will overview some jargon and terminology used in traffic engineering. We have an approach. That's the set of lanes that are coming into a particular intersection from a given direction. So there might be an eastbound approach of traffic that is moving eastbound in the easterly direction. A cycle is the complete amount of time that it takes to go from a red light to a red light. We think of it as a clock. The cycle length is the amount of time that it takes to complete the cycle, measured in seconds. While a phase is the part of the cycle that is allocated to a particular movement, the Greek symbol phi is used to denote it. When we say it is allocated to a specific movement, it means that movement receives the right of way. There might be multiple movements that receive right of way simultaneously, as long as they are not conflicting. A northbound movement and a southbound movement might both get the green light at the same time. They're on the same phase and they're not conflicting. Then the question is, what do you do with left turns? Do you give them a separate phase or do they share the phase? If they share the phase, then it becomes a little bit more complicated. Then the eastbound and westbound movements similarly might share a phase. The simplest intersection would have just two phases, one for the north-south movement, one for the east-west movement. A more complicated intersection might have four phases or more, with various combination of movements for left turns and so on. There's a convention for identifying phases. The different movements are numbered. Through movements are even numbers 2, 4, 6, and 8. Left turn movements are given odd numbers 1, 3, 5, and 7. 1 is in conflict with 2, 8 is in conflict with 7, 6 is in conflict with 5, 3 is in conflict with 4. It's just a standard way of representing the intersection. If you think about an intersection, people can also make right turns. What's the issue? Why aren't right turns given their own number? The answer is because right turns are protected. So anyone who's on 8 and wants to go through can also make a right turn and won't be in conflict. Phase 8 includes both through and right turns, as do phases 2, 4, and 6. We have some more terms. An indication is the illumination, the lighting of one or more signal lenses, permitting or prohibiting a traffic movement. So if there's a green indication, the green light is lit. If there's a red indication, the red light is lit. The interval is the period of time when all indications are fixed before any one of them changes. It's green for northbound movements, and green for southbound movements, and red for eastbound movements, and red for westbound movements. As long as all of those things are true, it's an interval. If you start to do things like make a red on the southbound movement but keep a green on the northbound movement and a green left turn arrow, that would be a different interval because you've changed the light on at least one of the approaches. There's a change interval, the yellow time plus the all red time, that provides for the clearance of the intersection. There's a yellow light. What does the yellow light mean? It means stop if you can. If that's the case, what is the all red for? The idea of the all red is to ensure that anybody who has entered the intersection on a yellow still has time to clear before the light changes to green. It's a safety thing. One of the key things to keep in mind about this, just as with anything, is that there's what's called risk compensation. The idea of risk compensation is that, as an engineer, if you make something safer for travelers, travelers will realize that it's safer and take more risks. If you have anti-lock brakes, you're going to follow the car in front of you more closely than if your brakes are not very good. If you know that the traffic engineer is going to put in an all-red phase, you're more likely to take the yellow than to stop at the yellow. That's not to say that there's no safety benefit from doing that, but it's to say that some of the safety benefit that you think that you're providing as an engineer is going to get up by you as a traveler behaving in a riskier way. This is true regardless of what engineers do. There's always risk compensation. As long as travelers can figure out that you, the engineer has made something safer, they're going to say, I'll be a little bit more aggressive because my risk is lower than it otherwise would have been. They might not use up all of the safety, but they'll use up some of the safety. There are movements. Protected movements have no conflicting traffic when making the movement. Protected movement has the right of way and doesn't have to yield to other conflicting movements, opposing vehicles, or pedestrians. The permitted movement is most common for left turns. If you're making a left turn on a green ball without a green arrow, you have the permission to make that movement so long as it's safe, but you are not protected. A new signal is the flashing yellow. This means yield when turning left. This is equivalent to the green ball, but frees the green ball to mean proceed for the through movements and allows a red ball in the through movement a flashing yellow on the left turn. For instance, if there's an opposing green ball and a green left turn arrow. We have more definitions. Green time, the time in which the cycle has a green indication on an approach. The red time, the time which the cycle has a red indication. Yellow time, the time in the cycle which has a yellow indication. The all red time, the time within the cycle in which all approaches have a red indication. We have different types of control. We have pre-time control, where you might think of it as the engineer sets it and forgets it. They set up a timing plan. It might 
change by time of day, but it's set and it's independent of actual real-time conditions. With pre-timed signals, everything is predetermined. You have fixed cycle lengths. You do this based on traffic history rather than real-time conditions. Traffic history is a good predictor of what's going to happen, but it's not a perfect predictor of what's going to happen, so this is going to be not optimal in general. If you could change it by time of day, so you could have a pre-timed plan for rush hour, a pre-timed plan for morning off-peak, a plan for the midday, a plan for the afternoon off-peak, and a plan for the afternoon peak, and a plan for the evening, and a plan for overnight. If you're in a downtown location or someplace that's very predictable, this works well enough. It's simple and can be coordinated. The fixed time signals work very well with coordination because you're smoothing out any of the variability that you might have, that you might have with a fully actuated signal. With a fully actuated signal, it's much harder to maintain a green wave. I don't want to say it's impossible. It can be done with computer algorithms, but it's harder. Now, if you want to coordinate your signals, pre-timing helps a lot because it's very hard to coordinate your signals if you have different cycle lengths at different intersections and a very different type of plan. It's not impossible. It just gets much more complicated. It can be adjusted in the field pretty easily. You can send a tech out there, and they can adjust some dials and change the plan. And you can set it for on-peak and off-peak but you can't respond to the short-term changes of traffic levels. It can cause needless delays, and if it results in disrespect because it's set very poorly, then that can result in liability issues, and that makes everybody nervous. A semi-actuated signal has a fixed pattern, but it adapts if there is a movement on one of the legs. For instance, if you have a major arterial and a minor arterial, you might put actuators on the minor arterial, and if the actuators don't get actuated, then the green time stays on the major arterial up to the maximum cycle length, and then you're given a minimal time to the minor arterial. If there's somebody on the minor arterial, then you'll change it at some point sooner rather than waiting the full cycle length. Semi-actuated signals occur when major roads meet minor roads. We generally put the detectors on the minor approach with the assumption that being that the minor approach gets a red light unless something is actuated or unless you've gone the full length of the cycle plan. So the major phase extends indefinitely or three minutes or something like that and the minor phase gets at the end of the cycle a minimum phase, the minimum phase possible, which might be eight seconds or something along those lines, but the minor roads get served once the actuator is there. The reason you still have a cycle length is that you have a car waiting on the minor street and the actuator doesn't work for some reason. You don't want them to wait there forever or to disobey the law. You might make it so that the signal will give them a green time even if the actuator is not tripped. Because maybe they're waiting at the intersection, but they're just short, they're too far back, or they're just short of the actuator. Fully actuated signals have actuators on all the approaches. Then we, have, then we can take account of the varying traffic demand. We have detectors on all the approaches. We have some initial interval, so some starting interval. Then we extend the interval if the actuator keeps getting set off. But if there's a large enough gap between vehicles, then you conclude there are no more vehicles in that approach. You turn that light to red, and then you give green light to the other approaches up to some maximum amount of time. So it allows for some flexibility. If you don't have varying traffic demand, there's no reason to actuate the signal. In a fully actuated signal, with the detectors on all approaches, we have a minimum time that's associated with a phase and a maximum time that's associated with a phase. Where you go between the minimum and maximum depends on actual traffic conditions. So the green interval is extended by, say, two seconds every time the actuator is tripped within two seconds of it being tripped previously. So if a car goes by, and there's less than a two second gap until the next car goes by, the green interval is extended. If there's more than a two second gap, the green interval is ended and then you go through the normal yellow and all red and red intervals as normal. So the question is, how do you end this process? Because maybe there's a car every two seconds forever. Well, you have two kinds of termination conditions, gap out and max out. Gap out means that there is a gap that is longer than your preset. So let's say longer than two seconds, in which case we assume that there are no more cars coming or the flow of traffic from that approach has reduced significantly and that it's safe to switch the lights and you're not going to cause excess delay by doing that. Max out is the maximum amount of time that you're going to give. You might want to set a max out in case the detectors are not being actuated on the side street or on the alternative approaches. You don't want the cycle length to be too long because it might be that an actuator is broken, but you haven't detected it. Or it might be that there's a car waiting, but it's not on the top of the actuator. You could think of it as shown in this graphic. There's a minimum green period, and depending on the actuation, there's, then it gets extended and extended and extended up to potentially maximum period. But if there weren't an actuation, then it would stop shorter of that.